church of God, we come to worship Jesus. Amen? What is Easter all about anyway? It's about the thing that we celebrate all year long, and that is Jesus dying on the cross, risen again for you and me so that we can live and have a life of abundance. So we're excited today. If you will stand to your feet, we're going to go back the ways and sing a song. Before we start with that chorus, John 11, 12. 
others and I just get just true encounters with Christ and I thought about that because in those moments you don't think about anything else you're just thrilled it's just an exciting moment to be in the presence of the Lord and that's just how it's going to be in heaven it's just going to be the presence of the Lord surrounding us and engulfing us it's not going to be like this every day guys it's just a better day is coming in the name of Jesus don't you want to go don't you want to go
we never take you for granted, Jesus. But may we just bask in your presence every day, not just on Easter Sunday, but every single day.
We thank you, Jesus, that all along the way, every day during our week, if we just look, we'll see miracles all around us. That the greatest miracle of all of Jesus is that this is not our home. And I thank you, Jesus, that we are soon to be with you. And that's the most amazing thing of all. So we just give him praise today. Amen. Give him praise as our pastor comes forward. Good all the time, and all the time the Lord's good. I'm not sure how many Bible versions Brenda and I have read together. The thing about reading Bible versions is every time you read a different version, you learn something you did not know. This year for Easter, what the Lord keeps dealing with me about is all the times that Jesus told his disciples exactly what was going to take place before it ever took place. And so, Jesus knew it. And this is the Easter story before the first Easter. We think about the Easter story on the first day of the week. The women come to the tomb. They find it empty. There's an angel there. Tells them that Jesus is not there. He is risen. And, uh, and so we know that part of the story, how exciting it is for the angel rolls of stone away. Uh, all kinds of amazing things happen. And we think about Thomas the disciple after the resurrection of Jesus. He still did not believe it until Jesus appeared in a closed room with closed windows and closed doors just appeared there. And uh, eventually Thomas comes into the room and Jesus tells him, here are the scars, put your hands in, put your, feel these scars in my hands and in my side. And then Thomas looks at Jesus, the Son of God, and says, my Lord and my God. So Thomas then believed, Jesus said, what's more blessed than to see and believe is to not see and yet believe. And so we're going to look at the Easter story before the first Easter, there are a number of these accounts in the gospel. And when you think about these disciples, there's a question we have to, to really ask ourselves or come to a conclusion. Why is it so hard for these disciples to understand that this was going to happen? The question that we ask ourselves is, why is it so hard for some people to understand that one day, there will be spirit bodies just like Jesus was. His body was a body that no longer had any of the issues concerning earthly life. Uh, and then uh, also, what about the new Jerusalem with the streets of gold and the walls of jasper and no pain and sorrow, sickness or death are there? Uh, why is it a little bit tough or a lot tough for us to understand that? It's the same reason, I believe, that it was just that hard for the disciples to understand it. They, they heard it. They didn't read it. They heard it from the lips of Jesus himself. And we pick this story up in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark was an interesting uh, disciple. Uh, he learned a great deal from the apostle Peter. And, and, and when you look at Mark, I remember reading in my Thompson Chain Study Bible when I got it, it gives these words that deal with the idea behind these books of the Bible. And it dealt with the, that Dr. Thompson's note said that the thing about Mark was that he portrays Jesus of this, as this man of action, always doing things. And in the King James Version, the key word in Mark is straightway. That means immediately, right then. So Jesus is now heading toward Jerusalem. Last week we celebrated Palm Sunday. Jesus going into Jerusalem on a donkey that had never been ridden. These people are quoting the psalm and that Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That was referring to the Messiah, whom they assumed that was, except they assumed Jesus was there now to set up his millennial kingdom, which hasn't taken place and won't until it's the right time. Now, in Mark chapter 10, we're going to look at 
uh, verses 32 through 34, New King James Version, can we stand together for the reading of the Word of God. The Bible says there, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. King James Version is astonished. That's the Messiah. But the Bible says here, and as they followed, they were afraid. The Bible says then, then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Here is the Easter story according to Jesus in the book of, or the gospel of St. Mark. These are the words of Christ. Behold, we are going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge or whip him uh, with very uh, painful whipping process. Uh, not ordinary. Uh, and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he will rise Again, what well, part of that is hard to understand? That is simple. I mean, he was probably speaking in Greek or Aramaic. We have it in here in New King James Version. But we're going to look at the Easter story before the first Easter. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace toward us. Thank you for the heart of God that tells us exactly what's going to take place. This passage of, script, of Scripture is, is just guarantees the authenticity of Scripture that it really is true that it, it represents itself and shows itself to be accurate because of the prophecies that have been fulfilled, that are being fulfilled at this moment and will be fulfilled until it's completed at the end of this age and the millennial kingdom and then in eternity. We thank you for it. Lord, as one man said concerning a miracle of Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's an honest prayer, and that's a good prayer. And we thank you that you are able to help us with our unbelief in the things that are difficult for us to grasp or understand, just as this was difficult for the disciples to understand. We thank you for understanding us and extending great grace toward us. And grace and truth came through Jesus Christ then we celebrate his resurrection on another Easter Sunday. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're so glad you're here. Before there was ever a Jewish Passover in the book of Exodus, and before there was the English word Easter, which different people have different opinions. I looked this up and I've studied it before. Some people think it refers to Ishtar, built on that, which is a goddess, a heathen goddess of fertility. Other people think that it refers to a different word, maybe referring to Passover that sounds like Easter. Doesn't matter. And before there was even, before there was ever the first Easter egg, and before there was the first Easter basket, or before the first Easter sale, or Easter egg hunt, before Jesus ever rode that donkey into Jerusalem, this passage of Scripture we have shared is what we could refer to as the Easter story before the first Easter. It took place at, 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 at different places. Jesus says this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, and it all happened in exact chronological order, the time and, and its place that he said it would. And we have this one final time Jesus tells this before he calls for a donkey that had never been ridden. And so we look at this. First of all, Jesus knew it. The disciples didn't know it. We have a hard time with it. And they had a hard time with it. But Jesus knew the Easter story, or what we call the Easter story, before there was what we call the first Easter. Here they are on the road. They're going up to Jerusalem. Jesus going before them. And, and they, they are, were amazed or astonished and, and they followed him and they were afraid. Now Jesus concludes his teaching here by telling them truthful facts. 
before he said this that we read about, that I've shared with you, he tells them this story about servanthood. Because uh, James and John, it's in one version, goes behind the disciples' back and, and asks Jesus, let one of us sit on your right hand and, you, and one on your left hand when you come into your kingdom. The other disciples uh, were, were offended by that. That's kind of like church. It's wonderful to watch Jesus pastor a church. It's kind of like that. As, if you're a parent and you've got two children, it's kind of like that. A, a Christian comedian, they get to each other. He said that they had two boys and they named them Grant and Lee because they knew they were going to fight. And, 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 and so here they were. Jesus was trying to put this fire out and he tells them that, that, that in, in Mark 10, 31, but many who are first there in the kingdom will be last and the last first. The Bible says when he said that, they were astonished. They didn't know the reason, but Jesus knew the real reason. He was going to Jerusalem. He tells them plainly in Mark 10, 33, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. And, and there, they're going to, to condemn the Son of Man, talking about himself, and deliver him to the Gentiles. So Jesus and the disciples are going. Jesus knows what they could not believe. In one place, Simon Peter said, this will never happen. That's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That'll make you feel good if you're one of the disciples. What Jesus was doing was completing his mission. They weren't exactly sure. I don't think what he was doing. They think, well, here he comes. He's going to set up his kingdom. But Jesus was completing his mission. He was going to be betrayed. We know that he was betrayed by one of the, the disciples that he chose himself, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Why not 31? Why not 29? Why not 20? Why not 50? Because the Old Testament prophecy said it would be 30 pieces of silver. Judas may or may not have known it, but he was fulfilling Scripture. And if it had been deal or no deal, you could tell Judas, you made a bad deal. But you know what? People make worse deals than that because they sell out their soul for a lot less than 30 pieces of silver. And that's what Judas did, and that's what everybody does who does not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If Easter means anything at all, it means that those who are lost can be saved. If it, mean, it means that those who are lost can be found. It means that Jesus changes lives just like the song that we heard earlier. Can we give the Lord praise? So he tells it, his disciples, I'm going to be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. The chief priests. They were descendants of Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. The leaders that God had set up, particularly Moses and Aaron, these people who were supposed to be doing the work of the Lord. And they were without knowing it. There are thousands of others who were descendants in that same tribe called Levi. The Bible says in Mark 14.33, this is the new century version, so we can understand it a little better. The people who arrested Jesus led him to the house of the high priest where all the leading priests, the old Jewish leaders, and the teachers of the law were gathered. Question, why were they, why were they not gathered in the temple? I'm assuming it was not. And it was not time for a temple worship of the Lord. This was a will and deal. An illegal trial taking place. Why were they all gathered at the priest? This home of the high priest. It wasn't the study Old Testament scriptures. And it wasn't a prayer meeting. They weren't meeting to discuss a ministry or a project. They were united in a single goal. Here's what Jesus said their goal was in Mark 10, 33. They will condemn him, talking, Jesus talking to himself, they will condemn him, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, to death. That's what, that, that's what that meeting was all about. 
In Mark 10, 34, they all mock him, and they did. They did sleep, spit on him, and they did. Kill him, and they did. Except, they did not take the life of Jesus. However, he did die on a cross, as it says in Matthew 27, 56. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. One version says it in English. Then he died. Interesting phrase. Don't miss the phrase. Yielded up his spirit. Why does it say that? This is what Jesus said in John 10, 16, contemporary English version. No one takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again. Just as my Father commanded me to do. He gave it up. He gave His life. That's what you hear in the Psalms. That's what you read in Scripture. He gave His life. Gave it up. Gave it away. If you do ministry of any kind, it doesn't matter what you do, it will cost you your life. You give your life away for the sake of ministry. You give it away. And that's what Jesus did. He gave his whole life away. You remember what Jesus told his disciples before they ever entered Jerusalem? Mark 9, 31 and 32. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Even after it took place, they did not believe it. But it didn't stop it from happening. Just because you and I choose not to agree with Scripture, doesn't affect the will of God and the plan of God. It just affects us in not a good way. Why did they not understand what Jesus plainly told them? Well, I thought about that. Maybe it's because they rather have the Jesus that they could go to and ask questions of. This Jesus who was part entertainment, though it was all ministry to Jesus, healing people, casting out demons, raising the dead on occasion, like Lazarus. Then these amazing teachings were so different from anything they'd ever heard before. And I've often thought when I've listened to preachers and when I'm preaching, I've asked myself, what would Jesus preach if he were preaching right now? Usually my answer is probably not this, and probably none of us would like it. He had a way of antagonizing people. Here is this Jesus of ancient prophecy. He's the one that would set up his kingdom on earth. They were thinking right now during his earthly ministry perhaps. They knew about Lazarus. He was being raised alive and Jesus had never even been sick. They had a hard time with it. Hard to believe it. They had a difficult time understanding something they had never experienced before and that is that way. I worked for a wholesale company for nine months one time from the guy who became my first pastor. I got saved in his ministry, but it was really great to pray and fasting. And so I, he was telling me about this job. I'm fairly proficient in math. It's not a tough subject for me. I like math and science and English. They were not hard for me and still not. So he's telling me how you do this job about ratios, and I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I could do that. I could. He finally gave up. I went to work there, and I realized I had no clue what I was talking about. All of the stuff I thought I had to have, it did not work at that job. I had to learn it from the ground up. And I worked there until I went back into printing. In 1 Corinthians 15, 53, here's our issue this about each, concerning each the Bible says there, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. What is that even talking about? Immortal, mortal, corruptible, incorruptible. Let's look at it in the Amplified Bible. 
For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable, imperishable nature. And this mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying that we currently all have, and if you're watching this later, that's you too, that is capable of dying, must put on immortality. What is immortality here? It is freedom from death. We read it, we understand it. Here's the New Living Translation. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal, that is human, dying, perishable, passing away by the heartbeat and by the breath, bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Well, some of us look at that apprehensively. You know, we all want to go to heaven. We just got quite ready to get on the bus this morning. And, 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 but yet, that's exactly the case. I remember reading about a tribe overseas. And these, this chief was asking one of the people in this tribe, what is it with these Christians that they seem to have a celebration and in their own tribe, there was no hope. It was all grief and gloom and sorrow and intense suffering. And the reply was, well, the Christians look at what we call death as though it's just a temporary journey and they will meet again. Well, that's exactly what Easter is all about, that we meet again in this life. We miss people. I've got a long, long list of people that I just could cry over that were so faithful here and they were now with the Lord. I miss them. I look at things they did. I was there. I, wasn't, I would hand them stuff maybe or keep them company while they did stuff or fix stuff. Sometimes I helped them. And I miss them. But if Easter means anything at all, it means we're going to see every one of them again. Praise God. It is a loss here. It is terrible here. But it won't always be like it is here. One day it's going to be like it is there where all of these things are behind. And what we have to look forward to is to ever be with the Lord. We'll leave all of this stuff behind on earth. It's not a bad uh, exchange when you give up this to have that. Amen. To give up this that is passing away by the moment, including the earth, and one day to have something permanent and stable that is going to be forever and ever with the presence of God and end up in the new Jerusalem with our loved ones. I don't know what it'll be like there, but whatever it is, it'll be just right. Tell me of the Lord praise. Easter Sunday. This is a 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, New King James Version. The Bible says there, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. First fruits. We could call it a down payment. Brenda and I were riding away across one time to pick up a car. We bought a car. Crystal was in the back seat. We do not use profanity in our house. So we're talking about the down, D-O-W-N, table. And so eventually she says, I didn't think we were supposed to talk like that. Some people may refer to it as that other thing. But I explained to her that when we go pay this down payment down, that means we can then drive the car away because we promised him to pay for it, which we always did. So far, so good. Well, when Jesus rose from the dead, that's like the down payment of our faith in a way. I don't think that's the correct analogy. But, but when we look at what he did, that tells us just as we follow him in this life, we follow him into the next life. That's what Easter is all about. Amen. This is the Passion New Translation. 
And as our musicians come, I will just come to a close. But the truth is, Christ is risen from the dead as the first fruit of a great resurrection harvest of those who have died. First fruit. Like the first thing out, first vegetables out of the garden. That's just the first, but there's going to be a harvest after that. More and more. I'm not a tomato fan. I don't like tomatoes, but for the tomato vote, my wife and, and uh, Tim love them. And, and so, unfortunately, I like watermelons when I was growing up. They waste all this ground and fertilizer on tomatoes. It was a terrible waste. Terrible. It, but the thing about tomatoes, they would just grow and they would grow and they would keep growing. I thought watermelons ought to be like that. But when you see the first ones, that's just the beginning. There's going to be a lot more, and that's the way the resurrection of Christ is. The Bible says, for since death came through a man, that is Adam, when Adam sinned, even though Eve sinned first, here we see that Adam is the one who is blamed. He was not deceived. He knew what he was doing and chose over the Lord. That's what we do when we sin. It is fitting that the resurrection of the dead has also come through a man. That is Jesus Christ. Easter means we can have a new life. I hope you have one. I hope you're living for the Lord. Easter means that God's grace is real. And that God looks beyond our faults, sees our need, and we all have needs. That because of Easter, there's a second chance, and a third chance, and a thousandth chance. And because of Easter, we have a hope that never fades away, just like the message on the side of the front. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Easter Sunday. What a great day. And we thank you, God, for everyone who is here. Lord, we thank you for all the Easter Sunday services that are being held throughout the United States and throughout the world. We're just one part of that. But we're all a vast family of God and part of that. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to be here. The Lord, if Easter means anything, it means that Jesus will change hearts and lives. When people turn from their sins, repent of their sins, turn to Christ by faith. What a wonderful, wonderful day for the people who make that choice. And Lord, today, if there's even one person that's not saved. This is a day to call upon.